My name's Angelo, and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire UFC Vegas 67 fight card. The break is over. Back to a normal schedule. I've already broken this card down, but I did it having no idea what the odds were because I did it a few weeks ago. So let's jump in. Let's find out if the odds have changed my mind. We'll talk about the bets that I have because I've got a bunch of bets going now that all the lines are out. So let's go ahead and dive in. Man, this is this is not a flattering... I am 6'3", 250, and this hoodie with this camera setup makes me look like 5'6", 390. Jesus Christ, there's no... Become a premium member. It's only $10 a month. That's $2.50 a week. We've got plenty of bets on the board, but it's not just about the bets. We have given you consistent units week in and week out. The last six event, I, I forget what the number is now because it's a new year, a new start. I'm not going to carry over last year, but... We were up, I don't know, 30, 40 units, something insane, just the last six events alone. So clean slate. We're going to start fresh, even though we're riding a nice little win streak there. It's only $10 a month, $2.50 a week. So you get the bets, the picks, confidence plays, raw notes, DFS plays, a DraftKings optimizer, fan duel content, monkey knife fight, prize picks, underdog fantasy, and so much more. It's only $10 a month. It is literally by far the best value in MMA betting. You are not going to find anybody else giving you this quality for that amount, $10 a month. Just go to wewonpicks.com and click become a member. And if you want to get the new year going with a couple extra bucks in your pocket, literally the only thing you need to do is go to wewonpicks.com slash bets. We have five different betting partners. Click on any one of them, make an account, put a deposit in there, and we will send you $50 as a thank you. It's that straightforward Check them all out, right? We prefer Bet Online because of the incredible prop bets they have, but they also lock parlays a little early and stuff. So then BetUS or my bookie can be some really solid of alternatives there. So check out the book that makes sense for you. And if you use our link and if you make a deposit, we'll send you 50. It's affiliate marketing. They pay us, we pay you. It, it literally could not be more simple or logical than that. We've got a couple of change ups on this card. I already mentioned I broke this down once before. We're going to do it again. This is a new fight. We have a dropped fight. We have a new opponent and we have odds. And it's always interesting for me when I break down full cards, having no idea what the odds are to then see the odds. Because there was a couple of spots where I'm like, oh, this guy's going to be an underdog and I'm going to slam it. And then they ended up being a favorite. And then there were a couple other spots that went the other way. So let's jump in. Opening up this card now, we have a late edition. This fight was just recently added. There's not odds for this one yet because it is that new. But we have Priscilla Kachera taking on Sajara Eubanks and Priscilla Kachera, she's primarily a striker, but she does have a nice pace, solid pressure. And if she somehow ends up on top, I say somehow because her takedowns are terrible, but if she somehow ends up on top, she's got really good pressure. She has power in the division and she can be KO or bust at times though. If you look at her stats, you'll notice that her striking differential is four to seven, which means for every four strikes that she lands, these are significant strikes, she is hit with seven. That is not the direction that you want your differential to go. If you look closer at her losses, though, she has been taken down and dominated in most of them. She's coming off the incredible knockout win over Lipsky, but before that, it was a, you'll see the win on a record, but it was a really bad decision over Kim. And I've said this many, many times before, but Sajara Eubanks is much better than her record. She's very strong. She's got very good wrestling, solid BJJ black belt. Grappling is always her path to victory, but it's also the most exhausting aspect of MMA. And we have seen Sajara have cardio issues in the past, but she's big. She's strong. She's a great grappler. She is coming off the surprising knockout loss to Melissa Gatto, where she was off to a solid start. She had a takedown, a reversal, six minutes of control time. And then she was put out. It's not surprising that she lost that fight. It's surprising that she was knocked out because she's typically, that's not typically how she goes. And this is a tricky fight because Priscilla's going to be big. She's going to be strong. She's going to be the much better striker, but her takedown defense is not good. And Sajara can be relentless with the takedowns. The issue though is that Sajara can also be hittable on her feet and someone with the power of Kachera can light her up and put her out. The lean and very slight lean here is going to be Priscilla because of the relentless pressure and Sajara's questionable cardio, especially for a late edition fight. This is a low level fight. Not, and I don't mean that to be insulting. I mean, like these aren't two people that 
you know, are on wild runs, consistent runs, ready for a title fight. So there's no reason to bet on this fight. We don't even have odds yet, but there's no reason to bet on this fight. Just enjoy the fact that UFC is back. Sit down, get yourself organized for the rest of the card. The pick's going to be Priscilla Cachera, but I got to be honest with you, I I flipped this pick about 11 times. I just, I'm like, Sajara can take her down and, and control her. That's what happens to Priscilla. Sajara doesn't have cardio. Priscilla has power. Sajara was just knocked out. There's absolutely no reason to spend your money on this fight. Then we have, and surprisingly early on the card, we got Charles Johnson taking on a returning Jimmy Flick. I broke this fight down before the odds came out. Now the odds are out, and this had the wildest swing on the entire card. There was some insane live movement. Charles Johnson opened, I believe, a minus 120 favorite. Very small, slight, almost even money favorite. He flew all the way to a minus 500 in like a day, and now he's come back and he's settled somewhere in the middle in the mid threes, depending on your book. So wild line movement here. And obviously what happened was people saw this. Oh, Jimmy Flick's coming back after a few years. Hammered Charles Johnson. The line took off. And then people were like, listen, at that money, Jimmy Flick's no bum. Bet on Jimmy. And then now, bang, it's settled. There'll probably be a little more movement here as well, but it's pretty settled in the mid threes. And I mentioned Jimmy Flick is coming back after two years away and retirement wasn't an injury. He He retired in 2020, talking about his family and his father, all these other things going on. And I assume he got done what he needs to get done because now he's back. Style-wise, he's a grappler. He's got solid takedowns. He averages almost two of them per fight. His striking is stiff. He has a negative striking differential, so he's hit more than he hits his opponent. But he uses his strikes well to set up takedowns. He's coming off one of the coolest submissions we have seen over Cody Durden, where Cody caught a kick and Jimmy immediately jumped into a frying triangle. Charles Johnson is a very well-rounded fighter. His style is mostly striking, but he's pretty capable everywhere. And if you check out his Instagram, he's getting rounds in with Jordan Burroughs and a bunch of other phenomenal wrestlers. So he is preparing for this matchup. He does march forward with busy boxing and solid kicks. He has some solid power and he never stops coming forward. His cardio pressure and confidence is going to be an issue for a lot of people in the UFC. He's coming off his first win in the UFC and it wasn't without controversy though. It was very close win over Zalgas where he was taken down, landed fewer significant strikes and was backing up. He was a slow starter in that fight, but once he hit a rhythm, he actually looked really, really good. Jimmy's definitely a dangerous grappler who, as we know, can just snatch things up from anywhere, but I trust Charles to defend the takedowns and just piece up Jimmy Flick on the feet. Two years away, I have no idea what Jimmy Flick's going to look like. I have a feeling that, you know, Jimmy's going to have some rust here and this is going to be a showcase fight for Charles Johnson. So Charles Johnson's going to be a pick. It is a close turnaround, and I do like him much more at the minus 340s, minus 320s, minus 500s. I would not touch Charles Johnson at minus 500, and that's not a slight to him. That's just, those are crazy odds because Jimmy Flick is not a bum. Minus 340, maybe you slap them together with a couple other people. And go to weonpicks.com slash bets to sign up with any one of the sports books. Make a deposit. We'll send you 50 bucks. Pretty straightforward. Then we got Dan Argueta taking on Isaac Dalgarian. This was an interesting fight to break down before the odds dropped because I didn't know how those odds were going to land, but it's going to be an interesting matchup because Daniel Argueta is a short, stocky grappler who doesn't even bother striking half the time. He comes across a cage, wraps up your body, and then muscles you to the ground. He has very nice pressure and leaves almost no space for his opponents to work up. He has one single game plan. Is that get you to the ground and then pound away? He's coming off a short notice UFC debut loss to Damon Jackson, where he more than doubled Damon's strikes and got a takedown but he ultimately gave up the control time and that's what caused him to lose. Isaac Delgarian is also a wrestler and he's going to get it to the ground by any means necessary. If you throw a kick, he's going to catch that kick. If you don't, well, then he's going to shoot. And as soon as it hits the ground, he is immediately looking to scramble and work for positions. He will strike in transitions and look for submissions anywhere that he can get them. He's very active and he's not someone that you want to be scrambling with. This entire fight is going to come down to who initiates the grappling exchanges. If Daniel gets the takedowns, he can control on top. And if Isaac does, he can create a scramble and work towards a stoppage. There's a tough fight to call. I I think I'm going to lean Isaac here. I think his scrambles are going to be the difference because a sloppy shot by Daniel is going to create that scramble and then Isaac could potentially snatch something up. Arguet is going to be the better overall wrestler, 
but Isaac's going to be the better grappler. So I'm going to go with Isaac here. I, I don't want to bet this fight. When I broke it down before the odds, I said don't bet this fight. But Isaac Targaryen's a, a bigger dog than I thought he was going to be here. And all of a sudden, if you're getting plus 160, plus 170, you know, I don't know. Maybe an inside the distance decision no action bet is going to be the work because if he's plus money on the money line, inside decision, inside the distance decision no action might not be such terrible odds, right? We might get minus 120 on that. And Isaac Dalgarian, if there's a stoppage in this fight, it's going to be on that side. So I'm going to wait for that bet to drop. Those prop bets usually drop on Tuesdays. Maybe it'll be Monday because, you know, there's been so long for them to figure this stuff out. These lines dropped a little earlier than usual anyway. So that's the bet I'll be looking for here. I'm not going to do a straight money line in what potentially could be a barn burner grappling fight, but inside the distance, decision, no action. We'll take a look at that. If you are a premium member, make sure you link your Discord. You link, it costs nothing. You click a button, bang, your Discord's linked. That's how you get the alerts to your phone. So you get, boom. Angelo just placed this bet, and look at those amazing odds. I should tail it. We want picks.com at the top click, become a member. It's only $10 a month. What are you doing? What are you doing? The amount of money we've given you, the amount of value built into that $10, what are you doing if you haven't done it yet? If you have done it, make sure your Discord is linked so you get those alerts, especially on prop day. They start dropping randomly throughout the day. You're busy, you're working, you don't have time to hit refresh every 10 seconds. Not me. This is my life. You'll get the alert to your phone and you can tell. That's weonpicks.com. Click. Become a member. Then we got Alan Nascimento, and he's taking on Carlos Hernandez. Alan Nascimento is a fun striker who likes to grapple as well. He doesn't have much to offer in the wrestling department, but he has no problem getting into a brawl, getting taken down, and working sweeps and submissions from there. The problem is if he can't get those sweeps or create a scramble, he ends up on bottom the whole fight just getting pounded on. He's got okay power in his hands, but a low 20% takedown accuracy and a 16% takedown defense. He's coming off that upset win over Jake Hadley where he had two takedowns and almost 10 minutes of control time. Again, this is another fight that already broke down without the odds, so seeing how massive a favorite Allen is is very interesting, especially because he's fighting Carlos Hernandez. He's, he's a grappler. He's got okay striking, and striking-wise, he's got solid accuracy and deceiving power. He isn't the most technically sound guy, but he has a nice jab with a straight that follows. He's another one of these guys that has slick BJJ but doesn't have much to offer in the wrestling department. He'll take shots, but they usually get stuffed, and he ends up working with the upper body and then trying to get a takedown from there. He's been known to throw up Hail Mary submissions like flying triangles. He's a well-rounded guy that got two takedowns in his last fight, and that helped him tip the scales to win that split decision. This is a tough fight to pick. Again, I broke this down before the odds. If you're seeing the odds, then you think, oh, this is a slam dunk for Alan Nascimento, but I don't think so. I think this is a little bit of a closer fight. Carlos is a solid guy, and he can grapple and strike. But these decisions that he's winning, he's barely squeaking them, guy. And, it, and if you give somebody like Allen that room, it's going to be hard to win a split decision over Allen Nascimento. He's going to keep the pressure up. He's going to take the decision from you. And I think that's what's going to happen here. I think Nascimento can keep that pressure going, and he can get this done. I do wish he had better takedowns. Then I'd be a little more confident, but... Even in his loss to, to Gear Ulan Bekov, he gave up 12 minutes of control time and still made that a split decision. Alan Azimento's the pick. I am not betting on him at minus 425. There is no way he should be that big of a favorite. I get it. I picked him to win. But there are, like, you know, there's a scale here. You don't just throw money at everybody you think that's going to win and Alan Nascimento at minus 425. Let's put it this way. I have more confidence in Charles Johnson at minus 340 than Alan Nascimento at minus 425. Therefore, I'm not betting on Alan. I'm not going to throw him in a parlay. There's a couple uncertainties here that I'm going to go ahead and try to avoid. Then we have Javid Bajrat taking on Matoush Mendanka. This is an interesting fight. You guys know if you're a premium member, you know I love Javid here and the bets that I have on him. But Mataus Mendoka, he's not a complete bum. He's a shooter box fighter. So you know he's got solid striking, solid BJJ. He is primarily a grappler and he's going to work to the cage, work for takedowns, but he can strike as well. 
He is hittable on his feet, but he's dangerous. He mixes in elbows, spinning attacks, and he's always coming forward. He's making his official UFC debut here, and the UFC did not do him any favors in this matchup. Javid Bajarat is a grappler. He's got incredible offensive and defensive wrestling. He has absolutely no problems with a kickboxing match either, and he's landing almost six significant strikes per minute, and he's being hit with less than three. We have seen him outgrapple both. Tony Gravely, who's a nasty grappler, and Oren Kalan, as well as outstrike Trevin Jones. So the point there is we've seen him outgrapple people. We've seen him outstrike people. He's very well-rounded, and he's going to be a problem in this division. Mataus is famous, famous for winning seven fights in three months, right? That's his big thing. Oh, this guy won seven fights in three months. He dig a little deeper, and they weren't, I guess, the best. Oh, my God, man. It's been so long since I've done these videos, my tongue doesn't know what to do. It wasn't against against the best opponents. Nailed it. He's definitely a well-rounded guy, though. He can have success in the UFC, but Javid is just going to do whatever he wants here. Javid is absolutely the pick. Anytime you get a couple of undefeated guys, there's some questions, right? Because you don't know how long that O is going to hang out. But I think Javid's going to work here. We got three units on him at minus 309. That line has moved. You're not going to get that same minus 30 line value now. You're going to pay a little bit more for that. If you're a premium member, you saw that bet on the board. You got it. The value between the minus 309 bet that we got and what those odds are going to close at, that alone is worth the $10 entry fee. It's just, it's literally that simple. We're talking about $10. You drink coffee? You drink coffee? That's two a month. Two coffees a month. You're going to get all the picks, all the bets, the DraftKings optimizer, confidence picks, raw notes, FanDuel content, DraftKings content, a DraftKings optimizer. There's so much stuff there. I don't know what you're waiting for. Anyway, Javid is absolutely the pick. I'm very confident in Javid. I told you the three-unit money line bet on him, and I think he's safe to parlay. But, you know, the, these cards are weird, the ones after a break, because the lines come out early. Those are the initial movement. Then it settles, and then the normal cadence starts. The normal week. People start doing their research on their normal, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday schedule before the fight. The line's going to move again. Javid is not going to close anywhere near where we got him at minus 309. So depending when you're watching this, he's still going to be worth the money, I'm sure, until he gets to minus 600, then forget it. Go ahead. Throw him in a parlay. Make something happen there. Then we have one of the uh, switcheroos on the card. Mataus Rebecki, his original opponent, is out. Now he's fighting short-notice UFC newcomer Nick Fiore. Mataus Rebecki is a relentless grappler. He marches forward. He's got giant one-two punches before he just starts diving at legs. And even though he is a grappler, he will hang around for a striking match. Every single punch he throws is with intent. And when he gets you to the ground, he is looking for a finish. He can be a bit reckless, leaving him open on the feet and giving his opponent space to work. But he does have solid cardio, especially considering his pace. And even if he can be a bit sloppy, he's very dangerous. And you need to be on your toes when you're fighting Mataus Rebecki. Nick Fiore is stepping up on short notice. And he's not getting an easy entry to the UFC. Style-wise, he's a solid grappler. And he does have a BJJ black belt. His takedowns are just okay. But not what you would like it to be considering his strength is grappling. He has a nice step-in jab, but he's not a striker by any means. He's got a really wide high guard. So instead of here, it's like here. And you can't even see both my hands on camera. That's how wide it is. And the strikes do tend to get through. Makes him a little bit hittable. He's making his short notice UFC debut here. Good for him. He's on that Calvin Qatar, the New England cartel team. But, you know, sometimes it's a little too soon to be in the UFC. Like, I know that's everybody's goal. 6-0. and oh, Great job. You've done the right things. But then, bang, you're in the UFC. You're getting a killer in your first fight. That can actually do your career more harm than good. This entire card is loaded with showcase fights. This is going to be another one for Rebecca. Yeah, he already had a showcase fight with Omar Morales. He dropped. And then, you know, great. He got an... an I don't want to say easier opponent because stylistically, this is very different. And Nick... Could pose some trouble here because he's a grappler, as is Rebecca. But Rebecca should win this fight. And honestly, I think it may be inside the distance. I'm not a fan of betting on UFC debuts. But since we have two of them here, I think it's a double negative, right? They'll cancel each other out. UFC jitters, all that crap on both sides. That's sarcasm. But uh, I think Rebecca's a very solid play here. The problem is 
The odds are insane. Even if you want to parlay him at minus 700, I I, I don't think that's worth it. I don't think that's worth it. I do think he wins minus 700. What are the implied odds there? Almost 90% of the time he wins this fight. I, I'm still not going to parlay him. Maybe that'll tighten up. Maybe some Nick Fiore money will come in. You get him at minus 500. I would parlay Rebecca at 500 and Bajarat at, uh, you know, Javid at, at, I don't know, minus four. Not the best odds, but you put those two together, you'll get somewhere at minus 130, minus 140. Minus 130, minus 140 for two guys that are probably the closest thing to a guarantee on this card. That's not the worst play in the world. Some people hate my conservative betting. There are always absolute begging to be Twitter famous turd burgers that screen record these videos. Thank you. Tweet them. Thank you, super fan. And then do clown emojis. Like, oh, I can't believe this idiot said that. And then there's always a couple other Twitter dorks. Oh, I can't believe these people exist. Listen, I am a, there's different styles of betting. I am a slow and steady conservative guy. I will take my very consistent three, four units a week. You can chase. You can hit your plus 15 units this weekend and then lose 15, lose five, lose 20. All of those Twitter dorks that think they are just these absolute killer gamblers, check out my Patreon. All of those people are chasing nonsense. They're all, oh, check my third party tracked. Check my bet MMA tips. Have you checked their bet MMA tips? They all have negative ROI, especially the people charging premium. You dig a little deeper. Once you factor in the premium price, they have negative ROIs. And these are the people attacking me because I'm a conservative better. I do not like to bet underdogs that I think are going to lose in 50-50 fights. I do like to parlay what I think are guaranteed heavy favorites. You can clown. You do you. I do me. That was a wild rant for a random a random card breakdown. But anyway, in all seriousness, Rebecca should absolutely get this done. At minus 700, I do not like him to be parlayed minus three, minus four, uh, minus three all day, minus four, even minus five, he may be worth a parlay there. Minus seven, now we're now we're pushing it. So Rebecca's going to be the pick. That's my rant, hundred percent. Twitter dork's going to take the bait, snip it, clip it, ship it, and I'm fine with that. Eyes are eyes, baby. Sign up to become a premium member. We own picks.com at the top. Click become member. It is only ten dollars a month. Then we have Abdul Razak Al Hassan taking on Claudio Ribeiro. And this is an interesting fight for me because I had a half a unit money line bet here. I'll tell you who in a second. I had a half a unit money line bet here. Then I sat down a few days later, looked at it again. I said, Jesus, I need to bet this. I threw another unit. So now I have one and a half units, which is probably more than I should. I should have just done a full unit off the jump. But I have one and a half units here at two different odd price points here. We'll talk about that in a second. But we got Abdul Razak Al Hassan taking on Claudio Ribeiro. And Razak Al Hassan, we all know him by now. He's been around for a while. He's a powerful striker. He does tend to headhunt while looking for a knockout. He's a high level judo guy that just fell in love with his striking and power. He's such a talented grappler that if he mixes it in more, he's going to be a hard puzzle to solve. He's an incredibly talented guy. He has great power, but as I mentioned, he doesn't always use all of his tools. He's got the grappling and he doesn't necessarily use it. He's coming off that split decision loss to Joaquin Buckley where he got three takedowns of his own, but he gave up five. Claudio Ribeiro is an insanely powerful striker who earned a UFC contract with a wild left hook on the Contender Series. He has insane power in both his hands and absolutely bombs away while marching forward. He has almost no regard for what comes back his way and he doesn't worry about the takedowns. He is the epitome of implementing his own will and not worrying about his opponents. He has professional boxing experience and it shows. The easy path is to take him down, but he has excellent hips and he works his way back to his feet very very quickly. He's a dangerous guy. And I think the UFC set this up to showcase Claudio and, and give him an early win in his career over, you know, tried and true vet here, like Abdul Razak Al Hassan. And to win this fight, Al Hassan 100% will need to go to his judo roots and lean on his judo. He needs to close the distance immediately and take Claudio down. The issue is that he hasn't been using it. And God knows what Al Hassan was going to have to absorb on his way in. Judo is not wrestling. 
You're not going to be able to throw a jab and shoot underneath it. You have to touch. You have to pull in, get your hips working. Step through. Like judo is you have to make physical contact close before you can work the takedowns. Wrestling, you can shoot on the outside. So Razak Al-Hassan may take some damage on his way in. Claudio is going to be the pick here. I think, honestly, there's probably a stoppage. Obviously, a crafty vet like Razak Al-Hassan against a UFC newcomer can always, you know, be a shock, right? It's not ridiculous that Al-Hassan would pull off a win here. He's very talented. He's a veteran at this point. But I like Claudio. I got a few money line bets on him. I mentioned that different odds. I got him at plus 108 early, and then I got him again at minus 110. So not a ton of movement. But premium members, you've seen that bet for a little while. If you got him at plus 108, great. That was there a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations to you. I got that. Minus 110 is not, it's not plus 108, obviously, but uh, it's not like there's wild movement here. I am curious to see what happens throughout the week. Then we have one of the more interesting fights on the card. We have Umar Nurmagomedov taking on Hani Barcelos. Again, I broke this and every other fight down a couple of weeks ago without the odds. And I am surprised at these odds. Umar is a minus 650 favorite. Honey Barcelos is a five-time Brazilian national wrestling champion, a BJJ black belt, a very good striker. Regardless of if you think Umar wins, to say he wins 87% of the time, I was surprised by those odds, but let's break it down. Umar Nurmagomedov, he's exactly who you expect him to be with that last name. Also, let me know in the comments, what's up with this Khabib is retiring from coaching stuff? What's up with that? Is that real? It's just conjecture. Rumors are he's buying Bellator with some investors. Who knows what's going on there? Anyway, Umar is a little baby Khabib with phenomenal kicks. He is an absolute nonstop wrestler. He has three fights in the UFC. He's got nine takedowns between those three. 15 minutes of control time and two submissions. His striking is okay, but his wrestling is fantastic. He uses kicks really well to stay out of range. And then he comes charging in with his wrestling and he looks for takedowns. If he misses the first... He's going to transition to a second and then a third, and he just has nonstop, very solid chain wrestling. Hani Barcelos is an incredibly well-rounded fighter. He's an absolute beast. Striking-wise, he's got great low kicks, solid volume, and a great pace. Wrestling-wise, he is a five-time Brazilian national champion who averages around two takedowns per fight and has a 93% takedown defense. Team Revaliev was 0 for 6 in takedown attempts against Hani, and Hani dropped them twice in that fight. Hani Barcelos is the real deal, and he's coming off the destruction of Trevin Jones where he had two 10-8 rounds. I thought this was a tough fight to pick. The odds completely disagree with me. But I think this is a somewhat close fight. Hani Barcelos is, without question, the better overall fighter. Umar is so good at one thing, right? The wrestling that, yes, he can control this entire fight for 15 minutes. But Hani is a national champion wrestler. This isn't Arkansas versus Georgian. This isn't what we saw with that dork Bryce Mitchell, all the excuses now, versus Ilya. These are two actual high-level guys. Both of them are high-level. And that's what makes it so interesting. The exchanges are going to be determined by the entries and the scrambles. If it's a nice, clean, solid entry, well, then can Hani scramble or vice versa? It's going to be a very interesting fight. Even though Hani is going to be the better overall fighter, right? The better MMA fighter in the video game. Hani's going to have maybe less, you know, fewer dots in the wrestling, but more in the striking, more in the jujitsu. You know, overall, Hani's going to be the better fighter. This is going to be a grappler's delight. I mentioned these odds are baffling to me. I'm going to do a very slight lean towards Umar because I think he's more inclined to just dive at legs. He's just more inclined to start the wrestling where Hani's going to want to get those low kicks going, start to take the wrestling away from Umar. I am not going to be betting on Umar, especially not at these odds. What I might do when the prop bets drop We'll take a look. We'll take a look. Maybe a plus three and a half on Hani. Inside the distance decision, no action on Hani. Frankly, I think this is going to go to a decision no matter what. But of the two, Hani's going to be the more dangerous guy, right? He's going to be the better grappler. So I don't see Umar submitting him. And he's going to have the more powerful striking. So he could get the knockout. He could get the submission. So in all likelihood, Umar's going to win this fight. He's going to get the takedowns, win a decision. Hopefully a 29 28. That's where that plus three and a half will come in. Or potentially. Hani pulls something off. But either way, minus 650 odds for Umar is a bit surprising to me. He's going to be the pick, but 
you know, in my mind, again, I'm more conservative than most. In my mind, Umar's not going to win this fight 87% of the time, which is what those minus 650 odds imply. So we'll see when the props drop. Again, if you are a premium member, it's only $10 if you're not. So sign up now at weonpicks.com. If you are a premium member and there's over a thousand of you, link your discord. If you don't have a discord, just make one. It costs nothing. If you do have a Discord, go to your account tab after you log in, click the link Discord button. Within two seconds, your Discord is linked, and then you have access to the Premium Alerts channel, and you can get alerts on your phone. Just, boom, this bet happened. Boom, these odds dropped. Boom, all that stuff. Link your Discord. Costs nothing to have a Discord. We're not going to charge you to link it, and it's only $10 a month to begin with to become a Premium member at wewantpicks.com. Then we have an interesting female fight. There are some title implications in this fight. This is a very important fight to the division. We have Ketlin Vieira taking on Raquel Pennington. And Ketlin Vieira is a powerful come-forward striker with solid takedowns and top work. She marches forward, throws heavy, she looks to tie you up, and then she'll trip or Uchimata from there. Uchimata is where you have the overhook and you send the right leg or the left leg across the body, pull them over. It's like a wizard kick, essentially. On top... She's got really solid control. She pressures, she pounds away. She's not incredibly fast. She's not incredibly athletic, but she's big, she's strong, and she's fundamentally sound. She's coming off that controversial split decision win over Holly Holm where basically she was held against the cage the entire time, but got a takedown, and the judges scored it for her. It's almost as if they scored it for Ketlin because Ketlin looked like she was trying to win the fight more where Holly was just looking to try to win the minutes if that makes sense. Holly was clearly working for a decision and Ketlin was trying to get it done. So she's coming off that win. A lot of people think she lost that fight. Raquel Pennington is a tried and true vet who has been fighting the top of the division for about 10 years now. If you look at her record, she has only lost to some of the absolute best women on the planet. Her last losses have all been to current or former champions. She marches forward with strikes and then controls from there. She has a boring grappling style because she's not really looking to get you completely to the ground, but she removes the tools that you might have by working you against the cage and then dominating with control time and pressure. She's got fantastic cardio. She's good everywhere. She's coming off that win over Aspen Ladd where despite being taken down twice, she doubled the significant strikes. Holly Holm just lost to Ketlin using the exact same strategy that Raquel Pennington is going to be looking to use. Cage pressure, control time. It seems like the judges have just had enough with the cage grappling at this point and the control that don't lead to damage. So that's going to lean heavily in Ketlin's favor. This is a close fight. Raquel's going to be the dangerous opponent. But in a three-round fight, I think Ketlin can get her strikes in, do the damage, and then take the decision. Her takedown defense is solid. Her striking is going to be much better than Raquel's. And that means as long as she isn't just held against the cage, and as long as we don't have some sketchy judging, she should win this fight. She's only a minus 116 favorite yet. I have not bet. It is tempting because I do think she wins. That's almost even money. We'll see how I feel later in the week. We'll see if the line starts to tick. If that minus 116 starts to move in my direction, maybe I'll hop on it before the movement. I'm not sure. I think Ketlin wins and that's close money, but it's hard to bet against somebody like Raquel Pennington, somebody that good that has fought at that level for that long. That's what's that's what's sort of uh, keeping me back. But I do think Ketlin is going to win this fight, and I do think minus 116 odds are pretty solid. Then we have Puna Heel. Puna! Taking on Roman Kopilov. There's another interesting fight. Puna Heel's a decent sized favorite here. Puna Heel's a fluid striker. He's got a ton of power and he can put most people out on their feet. He was a D3 All American wrestler who, despite his wrestling credentials, has been taken down 13 times in six fights. So great offensive wrestling when he uses it. The defense is not, not as fantastic. He can be first round or bust though at times, but he does retain his power later in fights. It doesn't just fade or go away. He's coming off that win over Dalcha Lungambula where he gave up the first round and then landed clean in the second for the win. Roman Kopilov is a very good kickboxer with professional kickboxing experience. He's a low output guy who picks his shots and he tends to throw one strike at a time until he settles in and then he weaves together some really nice combinations. In both of his UFC losses, he was taken down and he has no answer on the ground and he just really has a hard time working back up. 
Roman striking is legit good, and he has very real power. He's coming off that underdog win over DiCherico where he found that stoppage late. And I think, you know, I think you have to go with Punahil here, right? Not only is he a dangerous striker, he was also a college wrestler, and we know that Roman absolutely has issues with wrestling and grappling. Punahil has more ways to win. He has to be the pick for that reason. But I'm not going to bet this fight because he's a minus 163 favorite. And while those odds are solid, like, you know, he could potentially, you could argue he should be a bigger favorite than that because of the gap in skill set on the ground. We've seen him let us down before. He should have smoked Brendan Allen and didn't. Like, Buna Heel is not a guy that you can just put your flag in the ground and be like, I'm positive that he's going to go out there and do exactly what he's supposed to do when he's supposed to do it. So, especially because while he's a D3 All-American wrestler, he's not always looking to wrestle. If we can count on his wrestling a little more, then great. But we can't always count on that. So, Buna is going to be the pick. I personally am not touching him at minus 163, but I know there's a lot of you out there that absolutely love him at those odds. Then we have the new co-main event of the evening. We lost my favorite fight on the entire card, and this is our new co-main event. We got Dan Ige, or as some people would say, EJ, which makes no sense. It's I-G-E, Ige. Anyway, Dan Ige taking on Damon Jackson. This line has completely flipped Dan opened as a plus 140 dog, and now he sits at a minus 140 favorite. Complete flip. Could be an arbitrage spot, but we'll talk about the fight. We got Dan Ige. He's a fantastic kickboxer. He's got speed. He's got power. He also has solid BJJ and underrated wrestling. He has had a tough run as of late in the UFC, though. You're going to see a three-fight losing skid, but those aren't low-level losses. He gave up decisions to Korean Zombie, Josh Emmett, and Mazvar Evloev. But ultimately, Dan is very well-rounded and a tough outing for most people in this division. Damon Jackson's a very good grappler. He snatches things up and scrambles. He's willing to slug it out on his feet, but he uses well-timed strikes to set up his takedowns. He doesn't typically have much power, but he does land some heavy shots and immediately start working for those takedowns. He has a low 41% takedown accuracy, but he has solid control when he gets there. He's coming off that wild K win over Pat Sabatini where he rushed forward <clears throat> and just blasted away for the finish. This is a tough fight to pick. This is a very tough fight to pick. A lot of lazy people are going to look at their records in their last five fights. People are going to go to Tapology. You know, Tapology's got little dots, green or red, for the last five. You're going to see a lot of green on the Damon side, a lot of red on the Ige side. They're going to be like, ah, oh, Damon's going to win. Done. And that's going to be a mistake because Dan's going to be the better striker. He absolutely has the higher level of competition under his belt. Ultimately, I do think Damon probably wins this fight, but I think it's super close and he needs to stick to the grappling. He needs to do to Dan what Mosvar Evloev did. Just constant pressure, constant takedowns. But with all of that being said, I'm not going to bet this fight. I, I don't want to risk money on something as close as this. The reason I do well, I've talked about this, I'm conservative. The reason I manage to be up units, sometimes it's only one. Sometimes it's four or five. And I know there's people out there, I'm up a hundred units. Get the fuck. Your units are too low. If you're up 25 units, 100, your units are too low. Raise your units, you dingling. Anyway, I'm not going to, I'm too conservative to bet this fight, but there is a spot for an arbitrage bet here. If you don't know what an arbitrage bet is, that's where you can get both guys at plus money. People who bet Dan Ige early got him at plus 140. Now you can get Damon Jackson at like plus 120. You could have plus money on both sides of this bet. And I actually think that will continue to happen. This line, I think, is just going to continue to swing back and forth because it's a close fight. And what people are going to do is they see Dan Ige at plus 140. They're going to look at it. Or sorry, they see Dan Ige at minus 140 right now, today. They're going to look at it and be like, what, Damon Jackson at plus money? Yeah, let me give that a shot. That'll happen. The line will move. Then Dan Ige is going to be the underdog again. Dan Ige at plus money. The line will move. So keep an eye on it. I'm not going to try to play that arbitrage game but there is an arbitrage bet in here people first of all there already is and second of all it may not be too late to get another one so damon jackson's gonna be the pick but this is a razor thin fight i'm just gonna watch i'm just gonna enjoy no reason to get this squirrely the first fight of the year then we have our main event nasser dean imavov taking on kelvin gastelum 
And it's an interesting fight. I have a weird, weird feelings about Kelvin Gastelum because he's a phenomenal wrestler. He's got power in his hands. He's got an incredible chin and he's never out of a fight. But he's very, very inconsistent. He's had all-time wars with people like Israel Adesanya. And then he comes out and just falls flat on his face like that quick submission loss to Jack Hermanson. If Kelvin actually dedicated himself, he has the tools to be a champion. First of all, he should be a welterweight. Second of all, he smokes entirely too much weed. And now it's legal. Now, it, whatever. But he was getting popped for weed when it wasn't legal. So, not exactly the most dedicated guy. But if Kelvin actually dedicated himself, he does have the tools to be champion. He's coming off that loss to Jared Cannonier, where even though he landed more significant strikes, he was dropped. And he didn't get his wrestling going. But he's a great wrestler with a good chin, power in his hands. And he's a dog. He's not a quitter. He's inconsistent, but he is not a quitter. Nasruddin Imovov is a very good grappler who's not going to stop coming forward. He can strike, he can counter strike, and he's got a solid striking differential of four to a little more than two. He's primarily a grappler, but he has showcased those striking improvements recently, especially against Ian Heinish last year. He had a nice jab, solid elbows, and looks very comfortable mixing it up. He's coming off that win over Joaquin Buckley, where he dominated the first two rounds before fading a bit in the third. And there's a lot of people that were like, hey, Angelo, Aren't you worried about his cardio? This is a five-round fight, not a three. I'm no more. I'm not more worried about Imovov's cardio than Kelvin's. If Kelvin was like an absolute, never gassed, constant pressure kind of guy, then yes. But that's not Kelvin. That's not so. Styles make fights, and Buckley will push you. Buckley will be in your face, and that's not what Kelvin's going to do. So Imovov gassed in his last fight, gave up that third round. I don't see that happening here in the later rounds. And, and if Kelvin showed up as the fighter that he has the potential to be, this could be an easy win for him. But he almost never does that. He almost never shows up in great shape, almost never shows up with an actual game plan. He relies on his athleticism. He relies on his chin to carry him through the fights. And I just don't see that working here. Imovov is, is not as talented, right? He doesn't have that raw talent that Kelvin does, but he will be more prepared in better shape and he will work to win this fight. At a certain point, hard work beats raw talent and I, it's going to be hard to keep backing these talented guys that are inconsistent. So I'm all over Imovov here. He's the pick. There is a world where Kelvin wins this fight, but I love Imovov. I got one unit on him at minus 195. Those odds have moved a bit. I think Imovov is safe for a parlay. You want to do a Nasruddin Imovov, a Javid Bajarat. You want to put those two together, together? I think that's a decent parlay. I think that'll cash. I think that'll make you some money. And I think that's pretty safe. He's one of the safer favorites on this card as we just broke down. Guys, thank you so much for the watch. Become a premium member. You hear me mention it, and there's always comments. Oh, bro, I can't. The advertisements. Oh, bro. First of all, F off. You just watched a free pick video. I gave you picks, insight, and bets for free on YouTube. You got to listen to a commercial or two. Deal with it. Second of all, it's $10 a month. In all sincerity, thank you to the over 1,000 premium members we have today. And, you know, welcome back to the people who took a break and they're going to hop on train uh, now that fights have started. It's $10 a month. You get the optimizer. You get the bets. You get the picks. You get to link your Discord and get alerts. There are plenty of people charging $30, $40, $50, $60, dollars 20 per event. Even per month at $20, you're not going to get the Discord link, meaning you're not going to get alerts on your phone. You're not also going to get a DraftKings optimizer. You're not also going to get all the picks. You're not also going to get the confidence picks. You're not also going to get the raw notes. You're not also going to get the prize picks. You're not also going to get the underdog. You're not also going to get FanDuel fighter rankings. You're not also going to get DraftKings ownership player rankings. You're not going to get all of that for $10, but you will hear. So go to wewantpicks.com at the top, click, become a member. We will literally never, ever touch that price point. We're not giving discounts. And we're not raising the price. $10 a month consistently forever. And it's only improving every single month. If you want 50 bucks, we want picks.com slash bets. Jump into any one of our partners, make a deposit. We'll send you 50 bucks as a thank you. It's affiliate marketing. They pay us, we pay you. It's literally that simple. But take a look. If you already know what book you want, great. If you don't, take a look. There are pros and cons to every single one of them. Frankly, if you sign up for all of them, I'll pay you $50 on each. If you sign up for just one, take a look. See if you like the deposit match. If you don't want the deposit match, all sorts of options there. Jump in, sign up, make a deposit. I will send you $50 as a thank you.